from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I am Guha Shankar, and on behalf of Betsy Peterson, director of the American Folklife Center, uh, we're very glad to welcome all of you old new faces uh, to the center's public program series, Many Paths to Freedom, Looking Back, Looking Ahead at the Long Civil Rights Movement. Uh, I'm going to turn the podium over in just a second to our uh, guest of uh, uh, honor here, Charlie Cobb, but uh, we need to do the necessary uh, paid party political announcements, which I'm going to do right now. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the uh, sponsorship and uh, 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 partnership that we've had with the uh, first, the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture, represented here by Rex Ellis, uh, Associate Director for Curatorial Affairs, and Elaine Nichols, who is somewhere out there. I think she's buying one of Charlie's books even as we speak, so that, that's a good thing. Um, within the uh, uh, library, we have, of course, uh, uh, been helped out throughout the series with uh, various partners and divisions, including the Motion Picture Broadcast Recorded Sound Division, the Education Outreach Program, the Prints and Photographs uh, uh, Division, Manuscripts Division, the Office of Strategic Initiatives, who is responsible for um, you know, mounting our uh, website on the Civil Rights History Project, which uh, we launched yesterday with, to uh, all proper acclaim. Um, as you know, with the Civil Rights History Project, we've been working with the NMAHC uh, over the last five years on the uh, uh, initiative. Uh, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with all of our colleagues at the uh, NMAHC. And uh, we have now posted online uh, 55 interviews, and shortly we'll be up to our magic number of 108 total interviews with over 130 uh, participants uh, who were active in the freedom struggle. Uh, so if you haven't already done so, bookmark our website, uh, become a friend on Facebook, subscribe to our RSS feeds, and you'll get instant notices about uh, the CRHP uh, uh, updates uh, and other information about programs uh, in the series and uh, the AFC. Uh, the library itself, just stepping back a little bit, uh, uh, has been uh, attending to and commemorating and marking various events in the freedom struggle and the civil rights movement. Um, We've been producing uh, events such as a terrific exhibition on um, uh, A Day Like No Other, which marked the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Uh, in just a couple of months, and I'm sorry, in just a month, on June 19th, the Inter Interpretive Programs Office at the library will launch a major exhibition to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act, uh, passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Uh, it'll feature unique items from divisions across the library, along with materials from the AFC collections, including the CRHP, National Visionary Leadership Project, and other collections. Obviously, not every uh, object, photo, video, manuscript that is housed in the various divisions of the library will make it out into public view, but uh, there will be a rotation of the uh, exhibition items in January, so as Roberta Schaefer, our assist associate librarian, said yesterday, come back twice. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a good way to do it. But uh, also also uh, make uh, plans to talk to your uh, reference librarian so they can get you into the collections and uh, you know, get you to those treasures. Uh, and then sp finally, speaking of external partners, I also want to acknowledge the uh, uh, assistance uh, and insights of uh, the folks of the SNCC uh, Legacy Project. Uh, Cortland Cox, uh, the president, along with uh, Charlene Krantz, have been instrumental in helping us program the series, not to mention that Charlie Cobb, our uh, guest, is also sits on the board of that uh, particular organization. So uh, we have many folks to thank, uh, many people to uh, 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 you know, acknowledge, and uh, hopefully this will just give you a sample of the, those folks. Okay, so I'm going to turn this directly over to our uh, guest of honor today, who is, uh, uh, well, if you only had to buy, if you can only read one book a year, I suggest you get two copies of this book read one and give the other one out as a gift. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, the library gets no uh, proceeds from the sales of the copies, which are out there in the hall. Uh, but it will eventually end up here being cataloged by one of our catalogers who will be part of the National Library. Uh, Charlie Cobb, uh, Jr. was born in Washington, D.C., so he's one of us. Um, he was Mississippi Field Secretary for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, from 1962 to 1967 working primarily in the Mississippi Delta. 
He was a founding member of the National Association of Black Journalists subsequently, a uh, foreign affairs reporter for National Public Radio from 1985 to 1997, a member of the editorial staff of National Geographic magazine, and here uh, it's uh, good to note that he was the first black writer to become one of that magazine's staff writers. In July 2008, uh, Charlie Cobb was inducted into the National Association of Black Journalists Hall of Fame. Um, he's the author of, previously, On the Road to Freedom, A Guided Tour of the Civil Rights, uh, and this book, um, This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed, How Guns Made the Civil Rights Movement Possible, which uh, that's a title to wrestle with, and a, a set of issues which I think are quite provocatively and brilliantly argued. Uh, it is a topic of his library presentation today. So please welcome Charlie Cobb. Thank you, Guha, and thanks to all of you all for uh, coming out. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Now, I'm going to do a couple of things, um, uh, two or three things, in fact. Uh, in the book publishing world, uh, there's uh, uh, what's called, with respect to a book, uh, the front matter. That's everything that you see uh, before the book actually begins before chapter one begun. So that would include the table of contents that would be uh, a foreword or a preface or an introduction of some sort, dedications and the like. So, so I wanna first of all, in an oral sense, uh, give you some of the front matter of the book, uh, which is not quite a foreword here, but sort of my reasoning. Uh, with respect to the book and the process that unfolded in doing the book. I won't spend a long time doing that. Then I want to make some comments uh, about the actual content uh, of the book and, uh, and uh, sort of outline for you why I think guns uh, made the civil rights movement possible. Then I'm going to sit down with Rex here and pursue that conversation in conversation with him and finally uh, take questions from you all in the audience. So that's a lot to do uh, in, an, in an hour or so. The book um, marks in some ways uh, my determination to, to address uh, the question of how the Southern Freedom Movement is portrayed. I've long been dissatisfied with what might be called the canon uh, with regards to the Southern Freedom Movement. Uh, the canon, you know, I think Julian Bond sort of, in a conversation with me uh, uh, when I began this book, sort of neatly uh, and with a great deal of irony put the canon as, as the general person gets it in perspective for me, Julian said, well, it all boils down to uh, Rosa sitting down, Martin standing up, and then the white folks seeing the light and saving the day. <laughs> uh, and that more or less is my complaint about much of the narrative. There, in fact, is, is, a, uh, is a newer body of scholarship emerging from younger historian Emily Crosby, who was here yesterday, Wesley Hogan, who was here uh, yesterday, um, represent that newer approach, Hassan Kwame Jeffries, Akadieli Omoja, these are all scholars, which I am not. It's important for you to understand I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter. I'm not a scholar. I lean heavily on my experiences, and I lean heavily on the scholarship of scholars, like these younger scholars in particular. And this was all pioneered by uh, Richard Kluger with his important work on the 1954 Supreme Court decision, Clay Carson, his work on SNCC, John Dittmer, and Charles Payne's works on Mississippi. So there is, I would say, roughly since the middle 1980s, slowly emerging a better scholarship, a more sensitive scholarship uh, to that. But, but as part of this discussion of front matter, what was really driving this book um, uh, was my dissatisfaction with how the narrative of the civil rights movement is presented in, in general. And this is a little bit ironic because, uh, you know, as a journalist, as a working reporter, which I have been ever since I left the South, I've mainly been a foreign affairs reporter. 
I covered Africa, I've covered wars, <laughs> I've bounced all over the world, partly with NPR, and then for 20 years with National Geographic uh, magazine. What was the tipping point for me was almost a volunteer effort. Bob Moses, who was here yesterday and a legendary figure in Mississippi's civil rights movement, asked me to help him with a book which is available now as um, uh, Radical Equations, Civil Rights from Mississippi uh, to the Algebra Project. And as Bob puts it, it's, it's my story in Charlie's book. That means I, I did most of the writing. <laughs> um, but after the book was published, I brought the book uh, to, to a school, a middle school, that had given me considerable help. Uh, the principal of the middle school, in the middle school, Brinkley Middle School, is in Medgar Evers' old neighborhood in Jackson, Mississippi. And as it happens, the school is directly across the street from a public library. And the library is the Fannie Lou Hamer Public Library. So I was getting ready to go up to the Delta, and I was sort of sitting on the steps of the school with these kids, middle school kids. And so I went into what I only half jokingly call old guy mode and decided to and decided to engage these kids uh, in a discussion about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. So I asked them sort of broadly, does anybody know, can anybody tell me something about Mrs. Hamer? Uh, who knows? Uh, and not a one of them, I was, I guess it was a half a dozen kids, and not a one of them knew anything about Mrs. Hamer. So my ride came and I got up and I pointed at the library and I explained that Mrs. Hamer was really important, not just to Mississippi's movement, but to the Southern Freedom Movement, and you needed to know something about Mrs. Hamer, that kind of old guy lecture, you know? Uh, and, and I was getting ready, and then I, I sort of ended those remarks by saying, I knew Mrs. Hamer, and I was getting ready to tell them a Fannie Lou Hamer story that I was certain would engage them so that they would all show up when I got back to hear more about Mrs. Hamer, as I, as I suggested that they do. But when I said I knew Mrs. Hamer, one of these kids, he must have been about 13 years old, leapt to his feet, looked at me in total amazement and said, Mr. Cobb, you was alive back then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he got stuck on the idea of me knowing somebody who, whose name was chiseled, uh, you know, in the front of the library, and I understood it, and I bit my tongue, and he didn't say something like, yeah, me and Freddie Douglas and Sojourner Truth, <laughs> Harry and Tubman all used to hang out and debate where to go in the fight against slavery. I didn't, I didn't say anything like that and just laughed to myself, but it occurred to me that, I mean, you know, Here's a 13-year-old, and the history, which to me is recent history, is so distant from him that he couldn't imagine that he's sitting on the steps of his school who, with someone who knew the actors in this history. And it, and, and, and it occurred to me that maybe I ought to turn my attention as a writer to... to addressing some of this history in writing. So I shifted gears, and I essentially have really since then, and that was in 2001, uh, have really not uh, uh, done foreign affairs <laughs> writing and reporting anymore. Not, uh, you know, I sometimes miss it, but I, I, I don't do it. I've totally turned my attention to writing about the Southern movement. So that one part of the problem and one part of the front matter, if you will, that's reflect, that I want to talk, tell you uh, that's reflected in this book is the need to figure out uh, how to make the history itself real and make young people feel connected to the history, I feel, is through telling them stories. So if you read the book, you'll see there's a lot of stories in here. There's analysis, a lot of analysis, but the book is built around stories. Most of the stories are about people who are not famous, 
were not well known. Yes, I have a couple of Martin Luther King stories in here, and I have some Megar Ever stories in here, but most are people like Janie Brewer and why she wound up making Molotov cocktails in her kitchen sink and she, when the Klan was coming to attack her farm. Uh, and they're about people like um, Hartman Turnbow, a uh, farmer in, Lowndes County, in Holmes County, Mississippi, who when he, when he drove the Knight Riders away with his, his rifle who were attacking his home because he was very active with the freedom movement in Mississippi when, when we came up the following morning, the first thing out of his mouth was, I wasn't being non-non-violent, I was just protecting my family. <laughs> and, and the point being, you know, you could see that these farmers and these people in the rural South didn't see any contradiction between saying they're part of the non-violent movement, but also keeping their rifles and pistols ready or on the coffee table or in the, in the, in the drawer. So I'm, I'm trying to tell this story in a way uh, that young people especially can, can view it and understand it and also in a way that grown-ups can get something out of it. And another important influence in terms of telling these kinds of story or my commitment to telling these stories and a very important part of the front matter of this book is the influence of a person who should be much better known, Ella Josephine Baker. There would not have been a SNCC without Miss Baker. She was Miss Baker to us because she was 57 years old when, when she pulled the young people who would make a SNCC together at a conference in Shaw College in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, and I want to read to you something from uh, Miss Baker on history and understanding history that I hope will um, help you uh, understand what I mean. I could take the next hour and elaborate on Miss Baker's life, her, not just her importance to SNCC, but her importance to, to the formation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which is Martin Luther King's organization, her importance and organizing local branches of the NAACP in the South in the 1940s when she was director of branches for the NAACP. But that's another book that I will do at some point. And I, I would, but she did say this about history that's crucial to understanding uh, why this book uh, was written. And she says, in order for us as poor and oppressed people to become a part of a society that is meaningful, the system under which we now exist has to be radically changed. That means we are going to have to learn to think in radical terms. Uh, I use the term radical in its original meaning, getting down to and understanding the root cause. It means facing a system that does not lend itself to your needs and devising the means by which you change that system. That is easier said than done. But one of the things that has to be faced is, in the process of wanting to change the system, how much have we got to do to find out who we are, where we have come from, and where we are going? I am saying to you, as you must say too, that in order to see where we are going, we not only must remember where we have been, but we must understand where we have been. This idea of Miss Baker talking to us uh, is at the core of the reasoning for doing this book, is at the core of why I turn my attention from uh, foreign affairs as a working reporter to writing about the Southern freedom movement of the 1950s and 60s. Now there's some other things. Given Miss Baker's words, let me say, uh, uh, by way of critiquing, well, one of the problems I have uh, with the narrative of uh, the Southern movement, the way it's presented, is what's left out. One of the first things I learned as a working reporter is that news is shaped 
more by what's left out than by any bias that's put in. We can recognize bias if we see it in a newspaper account, a magazine account, or in a television news report. If something's been left out and we don't know it happened, <laughs> then we can't confront it, and it often shapes our opinion. One of my criticisms, for instance, right now we're right up on the 50th anniversary of the uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964. And one of the things I, I've noticed, in, and I noticed this last year with the celebrations around the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington of 1963, one of the things I, I've noticed and have criticized is that these events are portrayed as if they happen out of nowhere. They're not connected to anything. We don't know any of the history that leads up to, to why did this March on Washington happen? What was the thinking in people's heads about this March on Washington? And we see this continually absent from me. One of the interesting things I've noticed, and, and I admire a lot of the scholarship that has been done on SNCC, uh, Wesley Hogan's work, uh, Clay Carson's work. But it was interesting as I began to think about this book, and one of the questions that occurred to me, because remember I'm thinking this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. Well, the, the question that occurred to me and should have been a question to obviously ask by anybody writing about the movement, but it didn't, doesn't appear in any of the books, is how did SNCC get its name in the first place? Was there a naming committee? Did somebody stand up in a plenary session and say, I move that we be called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee? It doesn't exist in the literature. And I found, and it, so it was one of the first questions I asked of people like Chuck McDew and Charlie Jones, and people were there on, 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 the, on the founding conference of SNCC. And it was interesting because in raising the question, it opens up a whole area of discussion, the discussion about nonviolence that took place at the 1960 founding conference, the thinking that was in the minds of these 19, 20, and 21-year-olds who are sitting in at lunch counters, and remember they don't have much grounding in nonviolence, only the Nashville students really under the mentorship of Jim Lawson, Reverend James Lawson, really had any grounding in nonviolence. So how did all these other students then make their way to nonviolence? How committed were they to, I discussed this at some length uh, in the book, and I built it around the discussion about coming up with a name, SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating. Well, if you didn't have much commitment to nonviolence beyond using it as a tactic, why'd you come up with that name? Why not a name like the Deacons for Defense and Justice, as they came up with in uh, uh, Louis Louisiana? The thinking of movement people, people in the freedom movement, is the most noticeable absence in the historiography. We get the events, we know there was a Montgomery bus boycott, or we know there was a Supreme Court decision, or we know there were sit-ins that erupted in 1960. You know, we know there were protests in Birmingham, Alabama. We know there was a 1964 Mississippi Freedom Summer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that Stokely Carmichael shot it out, black power in 1960. But what is the thinking there? And can you really understand a movement without understanding the thinking. And to the extent that many historians describe the thinking, they describe what they thought we were thinking. <laughs> Nobody ever asks us what we were thinking. <laughs> they say, were you there at such and such a place? And then when they write, they go on to tell me what I was thinking <laughs> when I was there. <laughs> you know, so this is a huge, and not only is it a huge problem, it's an old problem. I want to read you a section from the book uh, that comes from Frederick Douglass's uh, autobiography, My Bondage uh, and My Freedom. And that's his 1955 auto, 19, 1855 autobiography, My Bondage and Freedom. There, in that autobiography, Frederick Douglass complained that William Lloyd Garrison and other influential white abolitionists thought that his intellectual growth 
weaken their cause. They only wanted him to, quote, narrate wrongs, end quote, bemoaned Douglas. Although after escaping from slavery, quote, I was now reading and thinking, end quote. However, if he did not have, quote, the plantation manner of speech, end quote, John A. Collins, general agent of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society once counseled Douglas, quote, people won't ever believe you was a slave. Tis not best that you appear to learn it, quote. The abolitionist went on to tell Douglas with no small degree of arrogance, quote, give us the facts. We will take care of the philosophy. Now, <laughs> this problem is still with us <laughs> when it comes to the history, and that's a lot of also what, I mean, I say in the introduction that the thinking of freedom movement people from SNCC, from CORE, from SCLC, form the intellectual spine of this book. I know the events. I don't have to talk to people in Mississippi about what happened during the 1964 Freedom Summer. What I want to know from Hollis Watkins or Wardine Henderson or any number of people, Margaret Block, or, uh, what I want to know is what were you thinking? Why were you thinking that? You know, let's talk about that. So it's important to understand, again, in approaching this book, that it's the intellectual spine, the intellectual spine of this book is the thinking of movement people, which is what is really most often left out of the traditional narrative uh, of uh, the movement. Now, before sitting down uh, with Rex, uh, a couple of other things. This book went through uh, several incarnations in my own thinking, in my own mind. Originally, I really was going to, this was going to be a book about rural culture in the South uh, and where guns fit into rural culture. Not quite an anthropological work but a book essentially about rural culture. And, and it's not that because I had neither the time or money to dig into such, to do such a project would have taken twice as long as it took to do this book. And it took a little over two years to do this book. Um, but it occurred to me along the way as I'm thinking about how to approach this book that an interesting story to tell, and I'm approaching my writing as a storyteller, is how activists from nonviolent organizations with varying degrees of commitment to nonviolence confronted the culture of guns that you find in the rural South. Because gun in the South, guns are a part of the culture, black or white. People use guns to go hunting, to put food on the table. People are very poor in many places. They use guns to keep varmints out of the gardens that they maintain. And yes, they use guns for self-defense. You know, and, and here you see the, the severest discrepancy in race in terms of the use of guns. Blacks almost always use guns for self-defense, to protect themselves from night riders, the Ku Klux Klan, or something like that. Whites would also use guns for aggressive actions against black people who they felt were challenging white supremacy. It's a radical difference in, in the two approaches to the use um, of guns. One of the stories I tell in the book, though, to, to explain, uh, give people a sense of guns in rural southern culture. The first place I ever worked in Mississippi was in Sunflower County, a little bitty town called Woolville, Mississippi, where Mrs. Hamer was from. Uh, the town only had 1,100 people. Uh, and, uh, and shortly after Mrs. Hamer and others tried to register to vote, night riders came through shooting up the black community. And the mayor of the town, Charles Durrell, had me arrested for doing the shooting. He said the voter registration effort was failing, and, and I had done this shooting to generate publicity for, 
for this failing voter registration camp. And he handed me over the town constable, by the way, was the brother of the man who murdered Emmett Till. And he hands me over to him, who sits me next to a police dog in the back of the car, and I'm hauled off to jail. Well, he lets me go the next morning, because it was an attempt to intimidate. But within the context of having arrested me, he had confiscated the shotgun of the man I was staying with, Joe McDonald, 76 years old. And when I got back, Joe McDonald is now worried about not having his gun because he needed it for just what I said. He had me, Charles McLaurin, and Landy McNair, three of us staying with him and his wife. And he would go out every morning and shoot a game to put food on the table. Without his shotgun, he didn't see a way to feed us. So what was he going to do without his gun? Well, I told him he had a right to his gun. And he asked me if I was certain about that. And I said, yes, it's in the United States Constitution. We had a history book, and I went and got it and came back, and I read the Second Amendment to him. And then Charles McLaurin, who was with me, said, you see, Mr. Joe, that's what we used to call him, it's in the United States Constitution. That's what Charlie's reading to you, because Mr. Joe could not read and write. He was 76 years old and couldn't read and write. And Mr. Joe told told me to fold over the page of the book and then took the book from me. And we more or less forgot about it, except an hour or so later, we noticed he's not around. So we asked his wife, Rebecca, well, where's Mr. Joe? And she says, he went to get his gun. You said it was all right. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Now we are scared because our fear is, you know, and this was a continuing fear in the organizing work that people would get hurt or killed because they're doing something that you asked them to do, voter registration or whatever. And the worry was that he's going to go down there and say, Charlie or Max said, give me my gun back <laughs> and wind up getting shot because this mayor packed a pistol because he went to the mayor's office because he had already stopped us, this mayor in another account, which I describe in the book and won't hear. He had already stopped us at gunpoint and tried to run us out of town. Uh, so we're worried that Mr. Joe is going to get killed and about to run out after him. But then we hear the rattle of his old truck pouring up, and there's Mr. Joe driving back from downtown. And of course, we rush out and say, what happened? And he says, well, I went down there, and I told the mayor I come to get my gun. <laughs> and we said, but then what happened? He said, the mayor said I didn't have a right to my gun. And so what'd you do? And he said, because he's sitting in the truck as he's explaining this to us, and he said, I brought the book, I held it up, and I told the mayor, this book says I do. <laughs> and the mayor gave him the gun back. <laughs> As he stepped out of the truck, and I, the image is burned in my brain, him stepping out of the truck, holding this shotgun, 22 shotgun, up above his head with this big smile on his face. And it was an important a demand, it seemed to me, as going down to the courthouse and trying to register to vote. And it also tells you something about the relationship of organizers to people who supported them in these communities, like Joe McDonald, rural communities. And it tells you something about gun culture, because the mayor really knew that Joe McDonald was not going to take his little 22 shotgun and get in his raggedy old truck and drive around town shooting into houses as a night rider. He knew this 76-year-old man was not going to do that. As racist as this mayor was, he knew that was not going to happen. Um, but the culture, I mean, I think at bottom, the mayor didn't have a problem with Joe Mac, Donald, having the shotgun. That's just part of the culture. It's like going down to the hardware store and getting some screws or, you, you know, or going out to the field and picking cotton. The guns were just part of the culture. So the book does try and show that and what it meant for people like myself and SNCC organizers and core organizers and, yes, even organizers from Martin Luther King's SCLC to find themselves 
in this culture, especially since we were almost inevitably identified one of two ways. We were either identified by the local communities as the nonviolence, and that's because of the sit-ins and the Montgomery bus boycott and other things, or we were identified as the freedom riders. And in people's heads, we were the nonviolent people. They considered that a little strange, but they liked the idea that we were prepared to fight and help them fight against white supremacy, which is why they could say with their shotguns and with their pistols that they were part of the nonviolent movement. And Steptoe down in Amit County, E.W. Steptoe, who kept maybe a half a dozen guns in his house, always saw himself as a part of the nonviolent movement. <laughs> you know, Amzie Moore, who sat up in the bay window of his house with his rifle, saw himself as a part of the nonviolent movement. So that's the, the other important point. I'll, I'll give you two examples and then sit down, because they, they reflect different ways. One is from Charles Sherrard, who is philosophically committed to nonviolence. He, Sherrard was the guy who opened up Southwest Georgia. There are few people in SNCC who believe more deeply in nonviolence than Sherrard. He told me two stories. I'll tell you what he told me about a woman named Mama Dolly Rains, and then tell you his response to a question I asked after he told me this. He told me, Mama Dolly had this big shotgun. I tried to talk her out of guarding me, but she said, baby, I brought a lot of these white folks into this world and I'll take them out of this world if I have to. <laughs> Sometimes, no matter what I said, she would sit in my bedroom window, leg propped up with that big old gun. She knew how to handle it way better than I did. In fact, I didn't know nothing about no shotgun. So I asked Sherrard, after he told me this story, I said, well, did you ever question uh, uh, your nonviolence? I said, you know, of all the people at SNCC, maybe you are. And he, sa he said, yeah. I, I, he said, I'm paraphrasing now because I don't have the book turned open to that page. He said, he said, the only time I ever questioned my nonviolence was when I got married and when I had children. Uh, so I said, so what'd you do, I asked him, the obvious reporter's question. He said, what I did was get four big dogs. In fact, I kept a dog until all my children were grown. And that's how he uh, reconciled. That's one way. Now, here's Hollis Watkins. Now, I, I, it's important to know that Charles Sherrard grew up in Petersburg, Virginia, and he's a city guy. Uh, uh, Hollis Watkins grew up in maybe the smallest place I could imagine in Mississippi, a little hamlet, not even as big as Ruleville, called Chisholm Mission. It's named for an AME church. Uh, and Hollis told me this, because I think it's important because you see, in a sense, the dilemma that that organizers have to confront in rural communities around weapons. What is, in the, it boils down to one question. What is your obligation to people whose lives are endangered because they're responding to you? What is your obligation to those people? Hollis says this, I was living with Dave Howard, and this is Holmes County, Mississippi. I was living with Dave Howard and his wife. They farmed. I realized after a few days that they had set up a shift to protect me and the house. His wife took a shift and he took a shift. One shift was from dark until midnight, the other from midnight to daybreak. Now here I was living in their house, eating their food, and I'm sleeping all night and this man and this wife, farmers, are up all night protecting me at daybreak He's in the field all day until it starts getting dark. When I realized that, I told him I would take a shift. He asked me if I knew how to use a gun. I said, yes, sir, I do. We don't use them in the movement, but I know how. To, I know how. But will you use a gun, he asked. I said, if necessary, I'll use them. So, he says, take a look at these and see which one you like best. I think he was testing me. 
He shows me a shotgun, a 30 6 and a 30 30 Winchester rifle. As I was checking them out, he said I could have them all. <laughs> Later, I told Jim Foreman, SNCC's executive director, about this, and he said, you can't do that. And I said, I'm already doing it. So <laughs> that's another kind of response to, and you find in the responses, and this is what really started to engage me, you know, I said, the story is really, that people really don't know is, well, what are the SNCC people thinking as they're finding themselves in these situations with guns? How are the core people responding to the founding of the Deacons for Defense and Justice? How is the SCLC chapter that was protected by an unnamed group in Tuscaloosa responding to these guys uh, with guns? That seemed to me to be a movement story. Then it's not the whole story. It's not even most of the story. But how does Dory Ladner, who's sitting back there, respond when Chuck McDoo gives her a pistol? <laughs> uh, uh, you, know, you know, that seemed to me to be an important piece of the story that's A, left out of the history, and B, uh, needs to be explored if you want to get a deeper understanding of the movement. And as I said in the beginning, what I'm about in my writing is doing the best I can to providing a deeper understanding of the movement. I think I'll stop there. I went on longer than I should have. I get carried away with some of these stories. And uh, Rex and I can talk. Thank you. I think the first question I want to ask is, where did you come up with the name? Uh, where, where, where were you? How did you come up with it, and how did you settle on it? The name is actually a con is it on? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the name is actually a contracted contracted version of a longer sentence made by Hartman Turnbow, a Mississippi farmer who was very active with us in Mississippi. The full quote is this, and this. Hartman Turnbow met Martin Luther King in 1964 at the Atlantic City Democratic Party Convention. Hartman Turnbow was one of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party delegates. When he met, after he was introduced to Reverend King, the first thing Mr. Turnbow said to Dr. King was, quote, this nonviolent stuff ain't no good. It'll get you killed. That's the full quote and it was just too long for a book title. So I just contracted it to this nonviolent stuff will get you killed. But the attribution properly belongs to Hartman Turnbull, one of the great figures in Mississippi's movement. You talked about Mr. Joe and um, uh, him getting his gun back. Um, I think that probably says a lot about community organization because you mentioned that as well. And you mentioned the importance of trust in building community organizations. You also talked about the fact that you know, one of the names that they gave you all was outside agitators. Well, so right. could you say something about trust, uh, outside agitators, and community organization? Okay. I'll combine trust and community organizers and then make one brief comment about outside agitators. Um, what I think you had to do as an organizer entering into these communities was earn the right to organize. You know, you, by going to these communities, whether like me you were coming from Washington, D.C., or whether like Hollis Watkins you're coming uh, from Chisholm Mission, Mississippi, when you come into these communities, you're bringing danger with you. You know, danger is already a, par a regular part of life, and people know in these communities know way better than you how to manage danger, life-threatening danger. I mean, for centuries, black people have figured out that <laughs> doing this from the days of slavery through Reconstruction, through uh, what, what Rayford Logan called the nadir after the collapse of Reconstruction on the way into the 1960s when we were working in the South, black people know about danger, but you are bringing it a different new danger into the community. When you, just by entering town, when we came to Ruleville, we weren't there two days before the mayor 
who also engaged in police patrol, stopped us and said, jumped out of his car, we're walking down a dirt road in town, the mayor, Durrell, stops, jumps out of his car, and points a pistol at us and says, I know y'all ain't from here, and you're here to cause trouble. I'm here to tell you to get out of town. And then he orders us into his police car. And McLaurin, uh, Charles McLaurin says, well, why do we have to get in the police car? And the mayor waves the pistol at us and says, cause this pistol says so. Well, we got in the car. <laughs> you know, so you're known and you're bringing this danger with you. And it's not just danger. One, one of the big differences between sit-ins and community organizing in places like Louisville. In a sit-in, the danger is all directed at you. You can say, I will sit at this lunch counter. And if these white people beat me up, I'm not going to fight back. That's your decision. Or you can say, I'm not going to do that. In the rural communities, it's collective punishment. You know, it's not just you when you're in there being targeted. It's everybody in the community. So they're putting a bomb underneath the church, or they're driving through town, shooting into homes. It's a collective danger. So the dynamic of how you're going to respond to it is different than if you were just sitting in or picketing or engaged in a protest march. Because if you're doing any of that, you've already accepted the fact that you're, you're going to get. So for instance, in Louisville, when the Knight Rider shot up the black community, two girls were wounded, but they had nothing to do with what we were doing. They were college students that had stopped to visit their grandparents before going on to Jackson State College. And they just happened to be in front of the window when the Knight Rider shot in. So that, that's a different kind of danger than you're faced when you're sitting in and you, know, and you say, yeah, I'll let them do that. <laughs> but, uh, and that's important. So you have to earn the right to organize, I think. And how do you do that? You, earn, you do that by talking to people. You know, you're sitting on the front porches, you're going to church with them, you're at the juke joint drinking beer with them, you're playing basketball with, with, with people, you're playing baseball with people, you're doing a whole range of things, and you're answering questions because people want to know who you are, what I call, in Southern culture, I, I call it the who are your people questions. <laughs> you know, and they're trying to hook you up with something that's familiar. Uh, to them. So it's important, for instance, for me in, in, in the Mississippi Delta to be able to say my grandmother came from Greenville, Mississippi up in the Delta, and my grandfather uh, came from outside of Clarksdale, Mississippi. Those are important things because people are trying to, you know, and it takes a little while. You know, what is it? Tall Paul Lawrence Dunbar, I guess, uh, you know, wrote the poem, We Wear the Mask that Grins and Lies, and so forth and so on and so on. Well, that's how people live. And they don't take off those masks and begin to reveal their real face until they really are comfortable with you. You've been fishing with them, you know. It probably helped for me a lot in Ruleville since, since uh, unlike McLaurin and Lanny McNair, two Mississippians I was with, I had never even seen a cotton field before, so I decided one day that I would go out into the field and try to pick some cotton. <laughs> that did not work. <laughs> but everybody got a big laugh out of that. I'm sure I was the subject of several nights of conversation <laughs> about going out there with this long sack behind me and lasting about a half an hour. <laughs> it, it was August after all. <laughs> So, I mean, little things like that, you slowly build, really, people teaching you something about their lives, you're explaining things about your life, because they've never been to Washington, D.C., or they've never been to New York, or maybe never even been to Jackson, Mississippi. So you, that's how you earn that right to organize. And you pick up when people, and slowly people come, A, comfortable with your presence, and, and B, decide maybe it's even worth trusting this guy enough to try and do what he wants us to do, like try and register to vote. And sometimes it does. And one of our big, Roku McLaurin and I laugh about this sometimes, there was a lady named Mrs. Anderson. She had what today would be called a convenience store, but in fact was a lot smaller than a convenience store at the end of the dirt road we were living on. And every time we walked up the road, 
past her store, she would yell out, it's kind of hot in here. Why don't, out here, why don't you boys take a seat right here? She had a bench underneath a pecan tree and let me go inside and get something cold for you to drink. Well, it took us a while, but we realized she never let us in the store. <laughs> it occurred to us, but she was afraid that if we were in the store, the white people might think we were up to something in the store mm. and burn up or blow up the mm. store. And so this went on for weeks and weeks mm. and weeks. And, we, and she was a gossip. And so she knew everything. I don't know how she knew this stuff. She knew what the White Citizens Council was up to, what the Ku Klux Klan was up to. And she'd give us warnings. They talked about you last night. Hey. <laughs> you know? So I don't know how her network worked. <laughs> but she seemed to know everything that was going on in this town. And our big breakthrough, Mac and I laugh sometimes, is, is that one day we were coming up the road and she said their usual thing, it's kind of hot out here. Why but instead of saying, why don't you boys sit down here while I go get you something to drink, she said, why don't one of you go inside mm, <laughs> and mm. get something to drink? I have no idea whether Mrs. Anderson ever tried to register to vote. But in my mind, in some respects, that's one of our more significant breakthroughs <laughs> in uh, Ruleville, uh, Mississippi. <laughs> Interesting. You also talk about, um, and you call them in your book, crazy Negroes. Uh, you mentioned C.O. Chin uh, from Madison County. You remember, you, you uh, talk about T.R.M. Howard. Uh, T.R.M. Uh, Howard, Theodore Roosevelt Mason Howard. Howard and. Um, <laughs> and you mentioned the Regional Council of Negro Leadership. These folk that you called crazy, you put in quotes because I think that you thought of them some, as something other than crazy. But I wanted you to sort of say a little bit and help us understand the sort of mentality of a C.O. Chan and Mr. Howard and their significance well, I put, the, put it in quotes because that's what white people call them. Crazy niggas is what they call them. Mm -hmm. Crazy Negroes, the more polite planter types might say. Uh, and these were people, uh, Megar Evans father was one of them. Crazy Jim, they called him, up in Decatur. Missy, he wouldn't step aside when the white people came down the sidewalk. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, and the story Charles Evers tells about Megar, you know, uh, is, is really dramatic. It's only, uh, D Decatur, Mississippi is a sawmill town. And uh, uh, James Evers uh, was going to the sawmill commissary with the then very young Mega Evers and the very young Charles Evers to pay a bill. Now, again, uh, James Evers could barely read or write, uh, but he could do numbers in his head. So when he got the bill, he saw the bill wasn't right and told the clerk, it's not right. And the clerk said, you calling me a liar? Nigga, they're standing in front of the counter. And he starts to move back behind the counter where, where everybody knew he kept the gun beneath the counter. Well, James Evers is standing next to a crate of Coke bottles. And he yanks one out and smashes it against the counter, shoves it at the clerk, and tells me, you make another move. <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, and uh, I'll do you in something that I won't go into the exact language. <laughs> In any case, he orders Charles and Megas to back out of the, to leave the store, and he tells Charles, according to Charles, he tells them, he says, now don't run, because there's some other white people there. He says, don't run, these people ain't nothing but cowards. And the boys leave, and then he backs out, holding the, the, the Coke bottle, and he goes home. Now, he stays up all night uh, guarding the house with his rifle. So I said, Charles says, well, why? Why didn't the white people attack him? <laughs> well, white people do a lot of dumb things, but they don't mess with crazy Negroes. <laughs> 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 and Charles Evers wrote in his autobiography, uh, and I think the point is valid because it matches exactly to my experience. Whites are not prepared to die for white supremacy. <laughs> boils down to that and it, you know and if you show that you're not scared of them then they will almost always in every instance of self-defensive violence 
that I know of in the South, whether it's Robert Williams in Monroe, North Carolina, whether it's the Deacons for Defense and Justice in Jonesboro, Louisiana, or Bogalusa, Louisiana, whether it's the group in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, all of places where there was actual uh, gunfire between white mobs or night riders and black people, white people run. When, when, when the night riders in Monroe, North Carolina decided to attack Dr. Albert Perry, who they decided was the real man behind the resistance to white supremacy in Monroe, North Carolina, because he was wealthy, relatively wealthy, he was a doctor, and he was a Catholic, <laughs> and he was from uh, uh, Austin, Texas. Uh, and when they attacked, when they came to attack after a Klan rally, the word had gotten out, so Robert Williams and a whole bunch of the people in the, officially I guess it's, it was the Monroe NAACP, but actually Robert Williams had also organized a rifle club affiliated with the National Rifle Association. <laughs> which was known as the Black Guards. And when these guys were there, and they had on helmets, and when the Klan came, they opened fire on the Klan. But they fired high, and they fired low. And they clearly, although they could have, were not trying to kill them. They could have killed them. These are trained World War II and Korean War veterans. They could have killed these guys, because these guys weren't looking for self-defense from black people in the first place. Uh, and, uh, but they didn't. They consciously chose to fire above their heads or low. And you see that repeated in Louisiana with the Deacons for Defense and Justice. You see that repeated in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And you see it repeated by individuals. C.O. Chen in Mississippi is a legend. I mean, there's, no, there's nobody in Mississippi that was like Mr. Chin. He was a small farmer. He ran a big time rhythm and blues nightclub. He was a bootlegger. He was a lot of stuff. Uh, and he walked around. He's the first black man I ever saw wearing a pistol in a holster tied down on his hip. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he provided, and this was a core project, and he provided arm protection for the core workers in Madison County, uh, Mississippi. Dave Dennis told me this story uh, about C.O. Chin, because uh, Dave was the project director over there. And Dave said, and I tell it in the book, uh, Dave says he had gone to court one day because one of his, the workers was being brought before the judge for some kind of traffic violation. So Dave was there. He says while he was there, while this was going on, C.O. Chin walked in, and he had his pistol on. And the judge looks over at C.O. Chin and says something like, now, C.O., you know you can't come in here with that pistol. But the sheriff is also there, uh, Billy Noble. And everybody knew there was bad blood between Sheriff Billy Noble and C.O. Chin. So C.O. Chen looks over at Billy Noble and says, as long as that SOB over there got his pistol, I'm going to keep mine. <laughs> right? This is in the courtroom. Dave says, I'm thinking, we're all dead in here. <laughs> Looking for a shootout. But then the judge intervenes and says, now, boys, boys, let's be good boys. Why don't you put your pistols on the table over here? <laughs> and so both men do. They ease out their pistol, kind of look at each other. <laughs> And walk over to the table and put the pistol on the table. That's Dave Dennis's story about C.O. Chin. And everybody that worked in that county has a C.O. Chin story. Matteo Flor Matteo Suarez, Fluky, Dave Dennis, George Raymond, if he was alive. They all got C.O. Chin. I never worked that county or that region of Mississippi. But when the Knight Riders shot up his house, shot at his house, I'm told. <coughs> C.O. Chen didn't just fire back. Then he got in his car and chased them to the gas station, <laughs> the Ku Klux Klan gas and shot. He served three years in prison for it. Uh, but he was that kind of man. Nobody, black or white, messed with C.O. Chen, arguably the most legendary of all the men and women with guns 
willing to use them in Mississippi. They're probably, he probably is the most legendary figure. Although, although there are guys in Mississippi and women, Mrs. Hamer said, Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer said once, she says, I keep a shotgun in every corner of my bedroom and the first cracker tries to throw some dynamite on my porch, won't write his mama again. So <laughs> there are men <laughs> and women <laughs> in this gun tradition, but C.O. Chin stands head and shoulders above them, I think. <laughs> why, why do you mention C.O. Chin and, and Fannie Lou Hamer and the, and the, what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the point you'd like us to leave with about this, this balance and this dichotomy between violence and nonviolence, guns and no guns, and how it sort of made the, the, the movement, uh, it was so uh, essential to the movement? One, I think, uh, the dichotomy between violence and nonviolence is a false one. I think the violence, the dichotomy made between violence and nonviolence is a false one. The average person doesn't call himself, even if he or she uses gun, doesn't see himself as a violent person. Nor does the average person, even if they're involved in the in the uh, nonviolent movement, uh, see themselves as a nonviolent. Person. There are a handful of people who would describe themselves as philosophically committed to nonviolence as a way of life, and that's an important part of how they define themselves. But that's very, very few people. I mean, people just see themselves as people. As, as Hartman Turnbull, I'm out here protecting my family. You know, he, he, he told uh, Howell Raines in, in, in his, Howell Raines' anthology of interviews with movement people that came out some years ago. He tells Howell Raines, he says, I had a wife and I had a daughter and I love my wife just like the white man loves his one and just like the white man will die for his and I'll protect, I'll die for mine. That's Harvard Turbo. That's how people seem to, so the important thing to take away is these are human beings and their responses are human responses. It's simple to understand why people would use guns to protect their houses, their families, their community, because they're human beings and that's what human beings do. They try and protect their loved ones. They try and protect it as best they can. People made very hard-headed choices about when to use a weapon and when not to use a weapon. We're not talking here about the organization of guerrilla armies. We're not talking here about the organization even of retaliatory violence. We're talking about the responses to terrorism. Night riders come through, shoot at your house. You know, as one farmer said, you got to be a very little man not to do something, you know? <laughs> and that's a human response, you know? Uh, it's just that the experience I'm talking about is our experience in Mississippi, which is the experience of black people in Mississippi. You can go to many parts of the world and encounter the same kind of responses to violence and terror. I think that's extremely important because one of my criticisms of the history is it's like black people are doing something unique. Well, no, if you're a slave, then I don't care where you come from, Africa, Asia, Serbia. <laughs> if, you're, if you're a slave, yeah, you'd be inclined to revolt against your slavery. The best way to understand that is that a human response to oppression. People resist it as best they can. Sometimes it's harder sometimes to resist oppression than it is at other times to resist oppression. But the human desire is to resist oppression. And the other thing I want to say very quickly, although it's almost another book, although I devote part of the first chapter to it, is you also have to understand this as an American story. You know, why is there racism and white supremacy in 1960s? Mississippi, because that's the way America was built at its very founding. When Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, when he wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, he did not mean black people. He had 200 African slaves. You know, the country, and here there's the country, in both in a de jure sense, law, was founded around white supremacy. Read the whole Dred Scott decision, and it's an argument, as it's a presentation by Chief Justice Brooke as to why black people couldn't be citizens. 
they would endanger the security of the state, he said. <laughs> uh, uh, and furthermore, they would have political voice, he says. This is in 1857, when the Dred Scott decision is written. Read the whole decision. Uh, because most people usually make out, just make the, use the quote, you know, the white, the black man has no rights, the white man need respect. Read the, the whole decision is even much more interesting than that one single quote. Uh, so the country was founded both in a de jure sense, which is finally gets eliminated by the, 300 years, 200 years after the country is founded in the 1960s, but the culture is still there. You know, uh, what you get when you establish a slave society, you have to rationalize why you're doing it. You rationalize it by saying, well, these people need slavery. <laughs> they're inferior, you know, they're helped by their enslavement much of what we heard something like that in 1960s Mississippi. But, uh, and that burrows into the culture and is much more difficult to remove than the law. You know, you can get rid of laws prescribing segregation. You can get rid of laws. Uh, you can make laws guaranteeing the right to vote. It's a lot harder though, and we see that with a lot of the reaction to Barack Obama, it's a lot harder to get rid of the notion that these people are inferior, that these people need to be kept in their place, that these people, you know, are ignorant, et cetera, ex are savages, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We're, that's a problem that's still with us today, but I'm trying to present and I spend some time in the front part of the book discussing the founding of America, what I call the founding contradictions. You know, and, and, and you, if you want to understand the 60s movement, it seems to me you have to understand 17th and 18th century America, and Virginia in particular. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, last, my last question for you. Um, Yesterday, when we were at the Madison uh, Center and opening the, uh, uh, the website, and uh, there was a panel discussion there, you were there along with uh, Bob Moses, and uh, Ms. Joyce Ladner was there as well, as well as her sister, Dory. Uh, but at one point, uh, Bob began to talk about um, the, the deaths that he had to face and how that uh, affected him. You could just see it in the way that he talked about it and just got quiet. And then Ms. Ladner talked about uh, two people that were very special to her uh, and how they had died and how she had to sort of deal with that. If you were to uh, just, just make a short statement about how this, you mentioned in your book uh, a woman by the name of Brenda Travers, uh, and then you mentioned also Bernice Johnson Reagan, and you talk about what the what the movement meant to them and how it changed them. How would you answer that question about what it did for Charlie Cobb and how it changed Charlie Cobb? Well, I mean, it, <laughs> that's a complicated question too. Well, it, it, the simplest way to approach that one, it certainly opened up a new world and new ways of thinking, both about myself and the world around me just opened me up to that. I mean, to be in Mississippi in, in early 1960, 61, 62, is to see, especially for me, growing up in Springfield, Massachusetts, and Washington, D.C., I mean, it's, it's, it is to confront you with a world, not just that you didn't know about, but you didn't even conceive of. <laughs> New ways of thinking. Uh, recognizing that there's no real link between intelligence and education, for instance. You know, recognizing that courage can emerge from the most unexpected places. Joe McDonald going down, you know, to get his shotgun back, as I talked to about. Mrs. Hamer, you know, going back to the plantation after she's tried to register to vote, being confronted by the plantation owner who tells her she has to remove her, uh, withdraw her application to register to vote, and Mrs. Hamer looking at the plantation owner and saying, I didn't go down there to register for you. I went down there to register for myself. 
So the, this courage that's coming from just totally, un especially with respect to Mississippi for me. I mean, you know, for my generation, Mississippi was wholly defined by the murder of Emmett Till. Wholly defined by that murder. I mean, there was, as far as we were concerned, there was no place on earth, indeed, the entire universe that could possibly be worse for a black person than Mississippi. And I got off that bus passing through Mississippi in 1962, big price, as I said yesterday, precisely because students in Mississippi like Dory Ladner were sitting in. And I couldn't imagine. That's one thing for me to be sitting in in Maryland or on the Eastern Shore. It, to my way of thinking, it's a radically different proposition to be a student in Mississippi sitting in. And I wanted to see who these people were. And if I hadn't done that, they wouldn't have hijacked me and kept me in Mississippi for the next four years. <laughs> you know, So that was a radical shift in my life. Then as a practical, finally as a practical and professional matter, I've been a working reporter all of my life since leaving Mississippi. And one of the things you had to do in the South and in Mississippi was learn how to listen to people and learn how to speak to people in places that you didn't know very much about or didn't know anything about. And those, of course, are invaluable skills if you are a reporter, as I have been. Let me, let me turn to the audience now. We've got time for at least a couple of questions. And we have two mics, so wait for the microphone. I'd like to... <laughs> I'd like to hear more about Josephine Baker and the role she played. I'm sorry. Josephine Baker and the role Ella. she played in the in the civil rights Ella movement. Ella Baker. Ella Baker. Ella, Ella Baker. Baker. Yeah, Josephine Baker had a role. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but before our time, as SNCC people and core people. Uh, Miss Baker, when when the uh, Miss Baker and 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 I, I will skip just for reasons of time, her very long history of the 1940s, her work in New York around the co-op movement and, and the like. Suffice to say, uh, in the, what it might be called the modern era of the civil rights movement first, it was Miss Baker who organized Martin Luther King's Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And she became the executive director. Actually, she was hired as the temporary executive director because these preachers had a lot of trouble with a woman being executive director. So she was the temporary executive director until they finally hired, I think, Wyatt Walker out of Virginia. Uh, so she helped found the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Then when the sit-ins erupted in 1960, February 1, 1960, Mrs. Miss Baker was one of the first adults to recognize the significance of those sit-ins. And there's a whole exchange she has, I won't go into, between her, Doug Moore, who then was a young minister in Durham, North Carolina, who had attempted sit-ins in 1957, and James Lawson, who was in the process of training a group of students sitting in um, to sit in in Nashville, Tennessee. To make a long story short, Ms. Baker managed to get $800 from Martin Luther King to bring sit-in students together at her alma mater, which was Shaw College then, now Shaw University, in Raleigh, North Carolina. And they had a conference of maybe a couple hundred students. I, I think that's, the numbers vary, anywhere from 120 to 200 or 300. I don't know, but a conference, and out of that, and what Martin Luther King wanted was a student arm to his organization because SCLC was sort of mired in place at that particular time, uncertain about where it's going to go, but that's another book. Um, <laughs> uh, but he, what he wanted was a student arm to his organization. They actually had meetings to talk about it, the ministers. Is, I wasn't at the meeting, so... Uh, I can't speak, I cannot speak to this from first-hand experience. This is, I'm, so I'm telling you what I've been told. And the stories vary. I mean, one variation, you know, they were all meeting. 
uh, and Ms. and these ministers were talking about which students they could convince to become part of SCLC, and Ms. Baker stormed in the meeting and gave a how dare you kind of <laughs> speech and broke it up or something like that. Chuck Redu told me, and I do use this in the book, Chuck being the second chairman of SNCC, that Martin Luther King asked to speak to the conference a second time, and at that second speech, he asked the students to become the student arm of SCLC, but went on to tell the students in order to become part of SCLC, they would have to commit to nonviolence as a way of life. And Chuck says the students weren't prepared to do that. They were willing to use nonviolence <coughs> as a tactic and in fact were using it, which is why they had gathered together. But when it came to committing to nonviolence as a way of life, they weren't. And, he, and Chuck says if it wasn't for that, they would have become, agreed to become a student arm of SCLC. Although Lonnie King, who was one of the leaders of, of the Atlanta student movement, differs a little bit because he says, I would have been suspicious of being a part of any adult organization. Mm -hmm. all would have, so, I, I, you know, this is memory. I mean, we're talking 1960, after all, and I'm asking these questions in 2011 and 2012. I'm sorry, 2012 and 2013. So I, I, there's a lot of latitude, you know, for the passage of time here in people's memories. Nobody quite remembers, for instance, how the name SNCC actually came yeah. about their various theories. Yeah. We'll go to this gentleman the back, and, and then, then we have a gentleman in the front row. One here and that'll oh and and then here and that'll be it. Uh, what my question is and I Chuck I come out of Bogalusa, Louisiana, where my father was uh, one of the founders of the ch first chapter. His father, I should say, interrupting you, I'm sorry, is a legendary figure in Bocaluza, not just one of the founders. His father is a legendary figure in Bocaluza. Yeah. Go ahead. My, in your <laughs> observation, uh, did you find that there became a subculture of defense groups? For an example, uh, we had, that was the deacons, and it was an organized structure. But then what we began to realize is that people sort of created their own structure, uh, to go out their, their, their neighborhoods or their streets or their things who were oh, not yeah. members of the deacons? Yeah, two things. And, go ahead. Okay, no, and my sorry. second question is, uh, do, did you see a difference between uh, an organization like the deacons overpowering the image of the, the civil rights group? For an example, uh, when people say Bogalusa, they think the deacons and they did all this, but the people who made things happen was the Bogalusa Voters League. But it's that image of what these people did, like the Panther Party. People think of them not in terms of what they were at, but this image that people got of them. Uh, can you, in your research, did you see any of that? Or can you comment about that? On, on OK, let me, let me do the, <laughs> the, the first question first, and then the, the second question. Yes, there, there were more local or neighborhood self-defense structures than there were a group like the Deacons. Uh, if you really look at the Southern tradition of self-defense, you really see it rooted in neighborhoods or communities aimed at, got, uh, uh, around, um, built around protecting communities. Even Robert Williams's group in Monroe, North Carolina, really took shape around uh, protecting the black community of Monroe and Union County. Uh, uh, Ma uh, Macomb, Mississippi had a self-defense group. Uh, a number of communities had self-defense group. And they weren't like the deacons. I mean, the deacons were a highly structured, I, and the deacons were, in fact, incorporated. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Jonesboro deacons, which was the first in, up, in, up at the top of the boot, up in North Louisiana, were the first deacons group. And they grew up partly to, as I say, self-defense for the community. And then around the very, very specific purpose, and this really distinguishes it from Mississippi and Southwest Georgia, around the very specific purpose of protecting core workers that were working in Jonesboro, Louisiana. Meanwhile, the Voters League in Bogalusa was catching hell, because Bogalusa, 
uh, I mean, was how Rain said it had no re redeeming value. Uh, uh, Rogalusa was a Ku Klux Klan town. I think the Ku Klux Klan's office was across from the mayor's office. Uh, it was a Ku Klux Klan town, and, and a core really slowly comes in into, into Boca Lusa, but it's really your dad, you know, well, you remember the, the core workers came to your house, and, and, and the sheriff showed up and told him to get rid of them, and your sister, Barbara, <laughs> uh, called the neighbors, and they came over with the guns. <laughs> Meanwhile, the sheriff had left, and that begins the discussion in Bocalusa about armed self-defense, and they invite the Jonesboro deacons to come down to Bocalusa and talk to them about self-defense, and they eventually, you know, they eventually form the Bocalusa church, which may be in the final analysis the most prominent because not just your dad, but Charles Sims, you know, and it achieved, by this time, the press is picking up on the existence of the, the New York Times did a whole series of stories on the Deacons, this armed group emerging in Louisiana, and, and it kind of focused on Boca Luce and, and uh, what's his name, Jim Brown becomes interested, I think he, I think he helps get guns into Boca Luce, uh, and so there's, there's a range of, there's interest in the Boca Lusa group. And that is somewhat unique. That is somewhat unique. Uh, the Tuscaloosa group, for instance, A, restricted itself to 50 members. B, they couldn't drink. They had to be church going. They had to be military veterans of either World War II or the Korean War. It was a very disciplined, and they never, they didn't want a name. That just made they, they didn't want any exposure, and they they were created for the express purpose of protecting the SCLC chapter in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, which was as bad a clan town as Bogalusa, uh, uh, Louisiana, and you don't have anything like that in Mississippi, and you don't have anything like that in Alabama. Although people in Birmingham protected Martin Luther King with pistols all the time. Uh, but you don't have anything like what you had in Bocalusa, Jonesboro, Tuscaloosa, uh, in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, although you have communities arming themselves. I mean, uh, relatives in Lowndes County, Alabama, uh, 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 Lowndes, Alabama uh, mem People from Lowndes County, Alabama, who formed the diaspora, the Lowndes County diaspora in Detroit and Georgia, were uh, bringing in particularly ammunition to people in Lowndes County, Alabama, because the gun store stopped selling ammunition to black people in Lowndes County. When they, I have a picture in the book of this old mm -hmm. lady with this shotgun about as tall as she is, sitting in a rocking chair mm -hmm. in Lowndes County. <laughs> mm -hmm. Alabama. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so the story varies. And also with the deacons, it, it's sort of like what happened with the Black Panther Party later on. You also begin to get local groups springing up, calling themselves deacons, but actually had no affiliation with the deacons, uh, just picked up on the name deacons. And you certainly had that in Mississippi, I think, in Natchez and uh, Belzoni and a few other places, these groups calling themselves deacons. And they were armed, but they really weren't chapters of the Deacons for Defense and Justice. Although Charles Sims did claim, Charles said there were 50 chapters of the Deacons across the South. I don't know about those numbers, but. Uh. Yes, sir. Uh, congratulations, Charlie, for a, a very uh, enlightening uh, discussion and for the book. Uh, I like very much. Uh, your definition of radical. It's uh, Ella Baker's <laughs> definition, I should say. Well, uh, yeah. of uh, actually uh, addressing the root causes uh, of the issues. And uh, I suppose all of us here uh, are tempted to revisit uh, the word radical because it has a, a bad name in this town generally speaking. So uh, thanks for that. <laughs> uh, 
I think you are well positioned with uh, your reporter experience, international experience, and with, uh, with this uh, fantastic work uh, on the South and the uh, snake and so on, to sort of uh, perhaps bridge uh, the gap and go from the micro, the American uh, civil rights movement, you know, uh, US centric approach to perhaps because in the 60s there was a, a global movement of uh, uh, revolt for dignity, uh, which is the independence movement uh, in, in the whole of Africa and also in, in the third world which is very interesting because it raises the issue of the fact that we actually, as human beings, we come from the same root. You know, from an Abrahamic perspective, we come from Adam and Eve, so we are one family. So the issue here is the question of Cain and, and Abel, and the question of analyzing the different cultures we spoke about culture, very important, critically, revisiting our cultures and seeing, you know, the Cain side of, of humanity and the Abel side of humanity. And here I'd like just to, you to address the issue of uh, nonviolence as an intrinsic part of a spiritual uh, mindset uh, in certain cultures uh, that actually uh, make people from a divine perspective peaceful and consider that as a high degree of being human. Thank you. Well, I'm... <laughs> Yeah, we we did have about an hour or two to <laughs> to really probe uh, such a question, <laughs> you know, and I and I'm gonna resist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm actually thinking about as a as a, as a follow up book to this to approach the question of nonviolence, perhaps not, you know, um, and both the practicalities and the philosophy philosophy of it. It just seems a natural outgrowth of this book. In fact, in this book, you will see that, that I explore on a regular basis in every chapter the tension between nonviolence and self-defense, because there's a tension, the, the tension in the choices that people have to make. I also say, uh, and really in an, in an epilogue, in an afterword, that I actually think that the movement legacy most worth considering today, given the growing coarseness of the society, given uh, the violence that exists not only internally in terms of the United States, but worldwide, might be nonviolence. I express, I must admit, some skepticism in the sense that the ideal is noble, but the reporter in me then kicks in <laughs> and doesn't quite uh, see how it works. And then I sort of issue a challenge obliquely in the, in the book, in, in the afterwards, to the proponents of, of uh, nonviolence as a way of life to dig into communities and explore how that might work in a, in a city like Chicago where we see these awful statistics of violence uh, within the black community of Chicago. Or if you go to state prisons, as this, in federal prisons, uh, you, you, you see a disproportionate number of black minority uh, uh, jailed for outrageous drug laws. But when you go to state prisons, you see a high degree of prisoners reflecting people of color killing other people of color or trying to kill people of color. Um, and that seems to me an arena 
I say in the book, <laughs> that seems to me to be an arena in which people committed to nonviolence as a way of life need to be thinking about working it. I mean, if you want to bring up the issue and work around the issue of nonviolence, say, in a city like Chicago, now how would you do that? Ivanhoe Donaldson told me in a conversation on this book, when I was working on the book, he said, he found it interesting, you know, he said, really, you know, there's never been, there's been a movement around issues, voter registration, nonviolent movements around issues, independence, voting rights, labor rights, and a range of issues. But there's never been a movement around nonviolence itself, <laughs> just for nonviolence, a movement to make nonviolence part of the political conversation, a movement that attempts to, to uh, instill in communities the idea of nonviolence as a way of life. And that seems to me to be a work people who are committed to nonviolence as a way of life should find worthwhile attempting to do. That, it seems to me that's as far as far as I can go in response to your comment. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. We have we have one final question. One final question from a civil rights worker in her own right. Charlotte, would you like to say something about this young lady before she asks her question? Tell the truth. Uh, yeah, I will. I will. I like to, I like to do I like to do these kinds of things. Uh, Don't tell too much truth. Uh, you know, but <laughs> Joan Trumphauer, as I sometimes slip into calling her, that as, as opposed to her old married name, that Joan Trumphauer Mulhan, Mulhan, <laughs> Mulhan uh, was a, transfer, a student at Tougaloo College in 1960. And she participated in the sit-ins in Jackson, Mississippi in 1960. And you have to imagine a little blonde girl from Virginia <laughs> being at a historically black college, not only attending a historically black college, but engaging in sit-ins with students from that college in Mississippi in 1960. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and that's enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> that sit-in was actually 63, and it was the point of my question. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't an organized group, it was, I think, Maker's next door neighbor, Wells, but after he dropped off folks for the sit-in, he went and got his parked the car, got his buddies, and they were in Woolworths armed for our protection in case of need. We weren't aware of it at the time, but in your research or knowledge with the you know, student sit-ins, not the community organizing stuff, was there much of this going on? I don't know. Uh, Lonnie King is the only one sit-in student who told me a story about being defended from by He says that he was the, Lonnie was the uh, chair of the Atlanta student movement, the Committee on Appeal for Human Rights. And, and obviously you have a, and he was a Morehouse student as well. And obviously as chair of a, of a group like COAR, of the Atlanta group, you get a certain amount of visibility. Lonnie said they publish not just their names in the newspaper, but their names and addresses in the newspaper. And he says, actually Lonnie says the story came to him secondhand because he was out of town. He says one night uh, some white guys came, came by and sat out in front of his apartment. Uh, uh, and nobody knew why they were there. And his, his immediate neighbors spotted them. So they, four of them came down. They were all Korean War veterans and they came down, they came down to the parking lot where the car was with their shotguns and approached the car from four different directions. And Lonnie says he clicked the shotgun and put it into the window which was open and asked the driver what he was doing, what they were doing there. And the driver said they were waiting for a friend uh, and Lonnie says he told them, uh, well, maybe you better wait somewhere else. And Lonnie says they jetted out of there, to, to quote Lonnie. <laughs> and that was the only instance that, that I heard a story, you know, about self-defense related directly to sit-in 
protests, although probably such stories exist in Cambridge, Maryland around Gloria Richardson and, and, and the people out there on the Eastern Shore. Book is called This Nonviolent Stuff Will Get You Killed. There outside, the author is Charlie Cobb Jr. Let's give him a hand, ladies and gentlemen. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.